Yep. I think is more I think is recording. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, hell right. yeah, brother. Hell yeah. I'm going to put yeah, on Yeah, I love doing this damn podcast. So Keith, uh, yes. oh shit, I was, uh, hey you, welcome. <laughs> uh, my name is Mike and welcome back to the That Chapter podcast, another epi. Um, kind of just go straight in. Yeah. Bite the pillow, we're going in raw for this one. Straight in, okay. Straight in. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh shit, you had your tattoo done, I'm just noticing. You I have, uh, like, what's it called, cling film or whatever? Cling film, yeah, or what do you call it it's in America? Cellophane? C- cellophane? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah you might hear some rustling. What's so uh, you got to... a... I just got like more. It's got like a bit of color put into it. Wow, then, it looks uh, really, really cool. Yeah, it's a bit sore. I had to do. A, uh, had but, to go over the elbow again. So that was a. Uh, so I've had my elbows done three times now. Wow, <laughs> I've only got two elbows, man. <laughs> <laughs> it really fucking sucks. But uh, it was actually really funny um, going in. So this has got nothing to do with the tattoo, but it was just when we were driving in. I got the bus into the city center to get the tattoo done. Yeah. And we were driving over the bridge. Doesn't matter which bridge. Mm-hmm. We were driving over on the bus, and I looked at the window. And there was a, there was like a swan stuck in the bridge a little what? bit. What? What do you mean stuck in the bridge? It was kind of caught in it. On that bridge, it's kind of like, a, I don't know how to explain it. It's kind of like wires, mm-hmm. uh, so you don't fall into the river. But there was like a swan caught in, in wires. I was okay. Like, I was like, oh, fuck like in the water? No, no, no. Oh. Uh, up on the bridge. Oh, on top yeah. of the bridge. I was like, like, what? Yeah, yeah, like where the cars and pedestrians yeah, yeah, and the yeah, Lewis yeah. goes by. Yeah, right. there was a swan stuck in that. So I was like, that sucks. Yeah. But then there was sucks a guy, right. there was a guy walking by and he seen the swan and he's like, I was like, is he going to help him? He did. He kind of, he helped the swan and grabbed his, I wouldn't have done it because <laughs> swans are vicious. I hear. Yeah. They'll fucking, they'll break your leg. Oh man, they'll go for you. Break, break your arm. They'll go for you and your family. That's what it hurts. Yeah. They are evil. But uh, yeah, he, he helped him out mm-hmm. and he like, took his wing out and he kind of he grabbed him. He's like, oh, that was really nice. I wonder what he's going to do now. He picked that swan up and he fucked him into the river. <laughs> <laughs> I've never... <You're> gone! <laughs> <laughs> I've ne- now, the swan was okay in the yeah. end. He was fine. Like I'd seen him swim off, but man, I've never seen someone throw something so hard. Like, that swan <laughs> went so far. <laughs> and it was huge as well. It was a massive thing. Wow. <laughs> You know, fair, fair play to him. Fair play to him. You know, he yeah. really got in there. Nothing stopped him. That's Good it, for yeah. him. Yeah. Good for him. He, he saved his, uh, sort of, Sammy saved his one. Uh, yeah, I'd say he saved his one. I he mean, saved it and he threw it off. off and it looked all right. Then, then threw it off and, a bridge. Yeah, yeah exactly. Swan is already having a great time. Look, all's, great. all's well that ends well. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's that's what I say too. Uh, I fucking co-signed to the fullest extent. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, what's up with you, Keith? Any uh, spooky tales for us? By the way, uh, just before you start, we will be recording our listener tales. Mm, yes. Probably next month. Mm. Um, we want to film it for sure. And next time we can essentially do it is... Um, is end of February. Mm-hmm. So we're going to record it in Keith's Spooky House. We've, I've got so many, i got another more listener tales. People are emailing me in. Thank you so much to everybody who emails in. Uh, I got some really good ones. Fantastic. Excellent. Can't wait. There's a lot of them. Like, this will be super long. But it'll be great. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. But any spooky happenings in had, the house? A, so I had a, something earlier today, actually. Uh, oh, yeah. Before down. So just... A, not great, a little spooky, but um, so the hallway is quite a long hallway and it's got two doors to the left and then there's the door at the end into the kitchen. So I was walking down and the two doors were open and then as I was walking by, the second door closed as I walked by it. Wow, that's and weird. I was like, that's fucking weird. Mm-hmm. But I thought it might be windows. Well, I had no Probably. windows open because it's freezing. Yeah, yeah. So I had no windows open the house and I tried walking by it again. I tried running by it to yeah. see if it was like wind as I was going by nothing it didn't close again so wow. I know somehow this door <laughs> just closed behind me which Jeez, is like, it was nope. a little eerie now yeah. it, w- it wasn't too scary because it was like 2 o'clock in the afternoon so yeah. it was like meh but I think if it happened at 2 o'clock in the morning it would be a lot scarier mm, but, uh, indeed yeah so yeah just yeah, adding on to the, the spookiness of the house yeah but, ding ding uh, another another yeah. notch in your belt there of creepy shit happening yeah. in your creepy house yeah hopefully uh, something spooky happens when we're down there recording yeah, yeah hopefully oh. it's something good yeah 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 I'll bring my like little night vision camera we can go ghost hunting yeah. we can tell spooky stories we talk about boys <laughs> 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 Maybe do some of those things. Uh, all right, let's get into this whole episode. Uh, today, we are talking about the Kamar Kamar Davan uh, incident. Uh, however, you, uh, it's fucking Kamar Davan, if you ask me. <laughs> That's how I'm saying it. So in this whole episode of the That Shepherd Podcast, we're talking about it. We're not doing a, a murder today. We're doing a spooky, unsolved incident in the mountains of Russia. Mm. Interesting. It's a good story as well. We're like, yeah. It is a good one. It's not short on horror, nor on mystery. This one isn't a who done it. It's a what done it. The unsolved camera dabbing incident. 
Now, many of you will have heard of the infamous Dyatlov Pass incident, which is really uh, super famous. I covered it a couple of years ago on the That Chapter channel. It's been covered by many, many people. Really bizarre story. Uh, this is one which has a lot of similarities. It also involves the Ruskies, and it takes place in the monumental year that is 1993. A fine vintage. What a year, man. Mm. Good, good year for movies. Yeah. Uh, Jurassic Park. We, yeah, with Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. uh, the Fugitive. Nice. Ground, Groundhog Day. Mm. Cliffhanger. Groundhog Day. Cliffhanger. Groundhog Day. <laughs> you, right now. Uh, Ned Ryerson. That's who I'm thinking of. <laughs> Wait, the, not, Groundhog Day came out in 1993? 93, yeah. Jeez, but... I thought it was way old. I always thought it was like an 80s movie. It feels older than all of the other movies you listed for some reason. It does, yeah. No, I, I looked it up beforehand. All right, cool. Fair enough. Oh, because then, it, yeah, when you think about it, it came out to see Jurassic Park, which still holds up. Like, Jurassic Park still looks really, really good. It does, yeah, yeah. For, like, a 30-year-old, over 30-year-old movie. Well, I don't think they used too much CGI. It was mostly, like, was that, wasn't that, like, animatronic? Well, like, even the CGI looks really, really good. It does, yeah, Like, yeah. Uh, when the T-Rex bursts out of the cage or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that part, that still looks, like, phenomenal. It does look good. Looks yeah, better yeah, yeah. than a lot of other CGI that yeah, has yeah. aged like shit. Well, I think it's too heavy on the CGI these days with movies. Yeah, you I need agree. to kind of go back to like the way Lord of the Rings was shot, where it was more like you know costume design, yeah, and, uh, camera trickery and stuff. Yeah, like that. yeah, it yeah. It just holds up a lot better. It does. It does. It, even some Lord of the Rings parts look a bit dodge mm. nowadays. But um, you know, what looks really, really bad is the um, prequel. Star Wars movies mm. like The Phantom Menace that looks like yeah, shit yeah, it looks yeah, terrible like Jar Jar yeah. Binks and stuff like that yeah, yeah, it looks yeah. so bad it does yeah hasn't aged well no aged like shit and I mean the movie is just pure shit so it makes sense be done with him so today, let's get back to our story. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you may as well uh, listen to what this episode is titled or talk about what this episode is titled. Um, so today, we're talking about the Kamar Davin incident. Located in Buryatia, in Russia's far eastern federal district, the Kamar Daban Ridge is one of the oldest mountain ranges on the planet. This is a place where I can assure you that unless you happen to live there, you've probably never thought about it like once in your, your life. The Kamar Daban area, it's just north of Mongolia, and it's the sort of place I imagine, you know, the gulags were at. There's simply nothing there. Endless plains, mountains. It's like pretty cool looking, but it's almost like humans haven't been there. If you're thinking of it in your head, just think of like Alaska or something. Um, it's pretty interesting though, like the towns and stuff, it's very Asian. Uh, the people look Asian, the buildings look Asian. It's really more like Mongolia or China than Russia. If you look at like the towns and cities. It's lovely, it's really scenic. Yeah, yeah, it does look beautiful, which is why people will go hiking there, mountains, I feel freaking like, boats, whatever. I feel like hiking isn't the right term. Because like, yeah. well, like when they go out, like it's more like mountaineering, I guess. Because like yeah. they're gone for days. Oh yeah, it's it's hardcore. Like hiking yeah. just sounds like I'm going for a hike. No, this is yeah. like you're gone and like it's almost dangerous. I mean, yeah. this is, well, hey, the story is pretty fucking dangerous. So yeah. um, like the last hike I took, I like I I had a coffee. I was pretty sure I was wearing skinny jeans. Delightful. Took forty minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You had a great time. You yeah, know, barely worked up a sweat. That's it. Yeah, maybe it's more of a walk. Yeah, well, no, it was, it, was, it was around cliffs. It was, no, a, walk, it. It was a hike. It was a hike. It was a hike. If there was a certain amount of incline on the walk, it counts as a hike. You ask me. So, the mountains in this area, despite having average temperatures uh, hanging somewhere between minus 16 degrees Celsius and minus 18 degrees Celsius, which is 3 degrees Fahrenheit and 0 degrees Fahrenheit, or simply very cold, the area, it's, it's very attractive, it's a very attractive destination for, as we were just saying, hikers, adventurers looking to test their skills against those darn Russian elements, the, the hardest of elements, Absolutely. if you ask me. Absolutely, man. And it's the, the, the Kahamar Daban Ridge is on the shores of Lake Baikal as mm. well, uh, which is actually, it's the world's deepest lake with a depth that exceeds 5,000. Wow. And so at the deepest point, you could fit two of the Burj Khalifas, the tallest building in the world, standing on top of each other. Okay. Uh, or, to put it another way, 5,000 foot long subways. Awesome. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, no worries. Thanks for that <laughs> input there, Keith. That little tibbet. <laughs> I'm just setting the scene. <laughs> yeah, there's a really deep lake nearby. <laughs> it's a cool. It's actually really good. There's a lot of history behind it. Yeah. I didn't go into it too much, but it is. It's you, were you going to give us the entire history of Lake Baikal? No, no. Okay. No, he says <laughs> shit. I'm going to save that for myself. Okay. <laughs> so... In August of 1993, a group of Ukrainian tourists were rafting down the, um... We've already been butchering the shit out of Russian language, so I'm just gonna keep doing it. Okay. Why stop? Why, why quit while we're ahead? <laughs> the Sneznaya River. Sneznaya! The, the Snez. The Snez hmm. is what I'm gonna yeah. call it. As they were rafting down the server, they came across a visibly confused, exhausted, and very emaciated 18-year-old girl along the banks. The girl was Valentina Udochenko, or Valia for short. Valia was the last surviving member of a seven-strong group 
from Petropavlovsk in Kazakhstan, made up of three girls, three boys, and her 41-year-old instructor, Ludmila Ivanova Korovina, master of sports in walking tourism, which begins as the coolest and ends as the lamest title anyone's ever heard. So, this group had set out, but only Valia remained. The other students were 23-year-old Alexander Sasha Kryson, 19-year-old Denis Svachin, 24-year-old Tatiana Filipenko, 16-year-old Victoria Zalasova, 15-year-old Timur Bapanov, and then, of course, the survivor, Valentina Udochenko. Now, mass hikes like this in this area are apparently a very common thing, and Ludmilla, who's the 41-year-old leader, master of sports and walking tourism, she was very experienced in her field. She was, like, highly respected among mm. her colleagues and students. She was tough on her students as well, really kind of pushing them to the limits, but everyone agreed that she was an excellent teacher who really taught important hiking and also survival skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She seems like she was one tough old bitch. <laughs> but what had happened to her and the rest of the group? Valia was in a very bad way, and after being rescued by the kayakers on August 10th, she was nursed back to health. And she told an extremely disturbing story of what had happened to her group in those mountains, the Kamar Daban Mountains. The Mountains of Madness. Oh. Do, 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 do. That was good. Do, 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 do. Yeah. The group had arrived in Irkutsk by train a week before were setting off from the village of Marino and walked non-stop. They had kept doing this rather than take consistent breaks to rest and refuel themselves. This is probably going back to what you're saying about Ludmilla being very hard on mm. her students. They, you know, she wasn't one to stop and dilly-dally. She was like, you must keep moving. That was good. You're getting Thanks. good at the old accents. Mm. Hey, listen, I keep trying. It sounds really good up here, so I don't <laughs> care. It sounds everywhere else. <laughs> This is all according to Valentina's account, of course. Just how reliable that is, we don't know. Even if she wasn't as completely crazed as the others, she was without a doubt suffering from extreme fatigue and a level of hypothermia had an impact on her thinking and whether she was aware of it or not. So, the reason for why Ludomilla was pushing them as soon as they set off so hard is very much up for debate. The leading theory, and the one I think by far the most sensible, is that Ludmilla's daughter was also out on a trek, leading another small group in that area, almost mirroring her own mini expedition. It's thought that the mother and daughter had probably arranged to meet at a certain point, and so Ludmilla had rushed her group along, foregoing vital breaks and perhaps making decisions in haste in order to arrive at the rendezvous point on time. When they didn't arrive, Ludmilla's daughter simply assumed they had missed one another and pressed on with her own trip. No idea of the tragedy that had befallen the other group. I think it's worth noting as well uh, at this point that Ludmilla, she was pushing the group so they could catch up with her daughter, as you said. Um, but I don't think she was being like crazy reckless. Mm -hmm. The weather forecast had promised them clear sunny skies and also the area that they were hiking was, it was a very popular tourist spot, which Ludmilla was extremely familiar with. And it was considered a generally safe place to hike, especially in the summer when, yeah. when they were there. Also, her students, they trained with her for the trip for weeks and they, they were ready to go and they were looking forward to proving themselves. So it's not like she was like rushing them up Mount mm. Everest or anything. Uh, and in fairness to them as well, the first two days of the hike, it went better than planned. The group, they were making really good timing. But on the 4th of August, um, at the beginning of their descent, the weather forecast proven that it was completely wrong. And yeah. they were hit with this rainstorm. And that was really the beginning of when things started to go wrong for them. Yeah. On August 5th, at around 11 in the a.m., the group were about a third of the way through this hike over untamed hills, mountains and wilderness when... Out of nowhere and without warning, one of the three boys in that party, it's believed Sasha, began showing alarming signs of some kind of seizure, and he began screaming from the back of the group. These symptoms began with the young man violently foaming from the mouth, before the group realized he was also bleeding heavily from his ears and nose. Sasha started to slip in and out of consciousness, and the other members of the group, freaking out, couldn't carry him for long. Within what seemed like no time at all, it was over. The foaming and the bleeding stopped, and he was the first to drop down dead. There was no obvious cause, and to the best of everyone's knowledge, he had no history of seizures or other afflictions that could have explained the sudden horrific symptoms. 
Those kind of things are usually disclosed before setting off on an arduous trip through the demanding terrain. And that must have been absolutely horrifying when they were just, as Keith said, it was going well. Mm. The last couple of days had been raining really, really heavily, which they hadn't been expecting. But mm. other than that, it was regular old hike or mm. mountaineering. When all of a sudden you just start screaming, bleeding, foaming, yeah. and then just drops dead. And that was it. Like, he didn't go down quietly at all. Mm. Uh, like I said, it's not like he just collapsed. He was he was at the back of the group. And as I said, he just started screaming. And when everyone turned to look at him, that's when, yeah, the foam and ble bleeding from the eyes yeah. and the ears and the mouth. It must have just been something straight out of a horror movie. On August 4th, the day before shit started to go down, Ludmilla, as we said, ahead of the expedition and an experienced hiker, she, for some reason, had thought it better to stop and rest on a bare slope rather than continue the hike for another 30 minutes, which would put them on a nearby ledge, which could have provided a group with wood suitable for a fire, trees to act as a windbreak, and a safe place to rest. The group, so hence, you know, they'd gotten completely soaked during these days for some reason. I don't know why Ludmilla, you know, leading up to this, had decided... Let's stop here in the middle of an open field rather mm. than rest somewhere better. But and that's it, even it's weird. like because like from the rainstorm, like mm. like they were soaked, but also their bags were soaked. Yeah, which added an extra weight onto them as well. So they were wrecked. Yeah, so there was kind of been some scrutiny over what Ludmilla was kind of doing, her choices mm. apparently at this time. Uh, but one person who never blamed her was Valentina Uduchenko, Valia. She said nothing that went wrong was her fault. Rather, Valia placed the responsibility for the tragedy of what was to come on inclement weather. As we said, the forecasts turned out to be very wrong. Heavy rain persisted throughout a lot of the trip. Mm. So, the next morning was the 5th, the day chaos and panic poured through the group. It had snowed overnight, and conditions were even worse than the group had already suffered through. Ludamilla would have known the extra danger the fresh layer of snow posed to the already tired and cold group, and moved them and their gear to the tree line below where they had spent the night. Again, why this decision was only taken at this point is a complete mystery. Though she sent the group down to the forest's edge, why Ludamilla then remained with Sasha's dead body is another mystery. She sent the group away to go and get shelter and rest while she stayed with a, with a dead man. Maybe it was out of some sense of responsibility, but she must have known that her duty was now to the five remaining members of her group, who must all at this point be suffering far more shock and panic than she was. I think the reason that Ludmilla stayed with the body was because she'd known Sasha for most of her life mm. and considered him nearly to almost be like a son to her. Ah. So, yeah, I guess when he died, it's understandable she mightn't be at the top of her game. But, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Like, she, you kind of need to stay with the remaining members, trying to get them to safety. Right, yeah, if she was the the leader of all this, you know, take, take charge or whatever. Mm. But then again, as you said, Sasha had suffered a pretty horrifying mm. debt. And so, um, Same yeah. was a bit shaken. Yeah, mm. exactly, yeah. Next came another twist in the tale. After a while, the five youngsters returned from the relative safety of the forest to the ledge where things had gone so wrong. It's believed they returned because they heard screaming coming from Ludamilla's direction. And by the time they got back to where they'd spent the previous night and lost Sasha, they were greeted by a terrifying sight. Not only was Ludamilla also now dead, she was lying on top of Alexander's corpse. She too was bleeding from the eyes and foaming at the mouth. The group had now lost both the oldest and strongest members of their gang. So to put it not so delicately, they were basically, they were up shit creek. Mm. The thinking amongst the group was that Ludamilla had died of a heart attack due to the traumatic sudden death of you know, one of her students and as you said, someone who was so close with her, though officials have never alluded to a heart attack as the cause of her death. This must have been terrifying as well. Like, the group, they were experienced, but mm. at the end of the day, they were still, for the most part, just a bunch of teenagers. Exactly, yeah, yeah, there were, there were children, so. So the five remaining youngsters were now rudderless and quickly fell into a state of panic and despair. Only Valia was able to keep herself calm and composed enough to attempt to pull the students together and get them down to safety. However, Valia's attempts to get the others to follow her to a less exposed area and, the, and regroup fell completely flat. Despite her best attempts, she could not get the others to follow her, even resorting to physically dragging and pulling other members along. Unable to corral the rest of the students, Valia eventually had to give up on her attempts to persuade them down and instead focus on what little energy she had left on saving her own life. The sad fact is, had she continued to spend that valuable energy in trying to get the others in line, she likely would have perished herself. Cutting herself loose from the group and going it alone, while usually the last thing anyone should do in the wilderness, in this case, it was the only way to go. 
Alone, afraid, and fighting a constant battle against hypothermia, Valia took her sleeping bag, along with some food and what few supplies she could find, and she went down to the tree line alone. After a day recuperating with it, the rain constantly battering her, she gathered enough strength to go back to the ledge to find out what had become of the people she had left behind. The news wasn't good. Two dead bodies were now six. All four remaining students, Dennis, Timur, Tanya, and Victoria, had all seemingly succumbed to madness and to death. Ludomila's body was exactly where it had been when Valia had set off for the forest, laid on top of Alexander, or Sasha, as he was known. The others were laid out in a rough line along this ridge, a few hundred meters separating them. Valia walked the line of the dead and closed each of their eyes. They looked to be in the same state, having suffered some intense, painful, and traumatic death, ripping their own clothes off, clawing at their throats, bleeding from their eyes. She had no idea what had happened, but she knew she needed to find help. Anyone who could help guide her back to safety. She took what little food she could from Ludomilla's backpack and headed back down to collect her sleeping bag before setting off to try and find some sign of civilization. This must have been like very scary. Because like, I guess with the first one, the first death, it could, yeah. have, been, could have been anything. The second death is very questionable. But the fact that everyone in the group was gone now, it really points to there's some external force that's causing this and then it's like was i exposed to that am i yeah. exposed to it right now so yeah. exactly you're absolutely right she must have been like any second now yeah i'm gonna this drop down me yeah. too yeah so scary yeah so after a day of walking valia managed to find her way to the snez something like that i'm sure it's the accurate pronunciation <laughs> She used an old relay tower to work out where she was and which way she needed to go to reach safety. And this is where she was discovered. Valia was laid out with her sleeping bag next to the river. Her sleeping bag was in the shape of an SOS banner, something commonly done by lost hikers to signal for help in the area. The rafters gave Valentina a very Russian welcome with a half a cup of vodka, VDK, and she straightened up enough to be able to give them a rough description of what had happened to her group. Despite, you know, what she'd been through and clearly being physically shattered, Valia had shown incredible resolve to get to this point alive, let alone being able to give any kind of coherent account of what had happened. Because what had happened turned out to be a lot worse than what I'd just ran through. Mm. I read one thing. Apparently, when she reached the river, one of the first things she did was wash her hair. And I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. She said that she did this because at this point, she still believed that she wasn't going to make it. She was going to die. Mm. And if someone found her, she would uh, at least have great hair. Yeah. So. I've heard that people are also saying, oh, must, she's obviously making it all up. After this traumatic event, she had the time to wash yeah. her hair. Oh, yeah, she's yeah. fine. You know, it's like, well, it's pretty traumatic. Everybody yeah. reacts differently. She's yeah, probably still yeah. in shock. And she's still probably at this point really thought, as I said, like she was being exposed to this stuff. Yeah. She's still expecting to probably drop dead any moment. Yeah. She's like, I'm going to look my best. Exactly. And you know, gotta look on get, fleek. get it, girl. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> gotta be a death queen. <laughs> Valiant described Alexander's sudden death after, after seizing Sasha, the first one to go, uh, you know, complete with foaming at the mouth and ears bleeding. She also described the madness that had followed the group's return to the ledge and, and, and their discovery of, of Ludomilla's body. Things were rough with the group, to say the least. Apparently, while Valia had been trying to reason with the rest of the group to get them, you know, away from the ledge, this completely, like, uncovered, uh, uncovered ridge area, you can look at pictures of it, it just mm. looks like a hill, a bare, yeah. barren hill. Mm. She was trying to get them off this hill to a forest to try and get shelter. The others were just totally out of it. 15-year-old Dennis had persistently run away from her, even hiding behind rocks like he was terrified of her. Victoria and Timur also showed distress and ran around panicked and crazed, tearing at their own clothes. It was Tatiana, however, who had shown the most concerning behavior. As Valia tried to calm Dennis down, Tatiana ran away from the group and began to violently bash her own head against the rocks. As well as bouncing her head off some rocks, Tatiana, yeah. she was also said to have been like clawing at her throat, mm -hmm. just like in a desperate attempt to get some air. Really, really horrifying. So when help finally did arrive to Kamar Daban, the bodies had already become partially mummified from the exposure to the extreme cold. It was, it was like three weeks later by the time that the rescue team got there. Wow, so that's I'm, crazy. I'm not sure why it took them so long to get there. Like law enforcement, mm. they never gave a reason why. Uh, it's such a remote 
area, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, it was still quite a busy trail. Like, during this time, they were just one of three groups oh. that were taking this trail. So I'm sure, like, during that three weeks, there were other groups hiking. Yeah, probably nearby. Yeah, maybe nearby, maybe past it. Yeah. Seeing the bodies. Look at that. That's not on the map. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Exposure had caused each of their faces to become swollen and turn a shade of violet blue. Animals had also clearly visited the site, as all of the deceased had their eye sockets completely hollowed out. Jeez. Something, yeah, well, gruesome is also quite natural in these situations and wouldn't have come as much of a shock to the experienced rescuers. The bodies were laid out just as Valia had described, but Ludamilla laid over Alexander and the others lined up along the ridge. The other four were each dressed in only their leotards, common underclothes for hikers, and three of them were even barefoot. Naturally, in the freezing cold climate, that makes for quite a sight. I mean, this is in August, but still, it's so cold. Yeah. very, very cold up there. So, you know, first thing you're going to think of when you've hear of these people in their leotards and some uh, without shoes on is that oh the paradoxical undressing they they got went crazy they got hypothermia and then they started taking their clothes off which is very very possible the bodies of the six victims of the tragedy were transported to ulan Oud, where an autopsy was performed with the official cause of death of each being listed as hypothermia due to exposure while that diagnosis would explain some of the questions, like the, as I said, this the paradoxical and undressing, the stripping of vital layers of clothes, it doesn't uh, exactly begin to explain the symptoms of madness and apparent sudden onset psychosis that Valia had described witnessing. The entire incident was classed as shit gone wrong, misadventure, what have you. That's what the locals and the government would say. Valia, she returned to Kazakhstan, pretty traumatized by what had happened, and the only real account of the Hammer Daban Pass is the initial one she gave. According to any resources I could find, she never spoke of it again. No, yeah. Apparently, yeah, she was just so traumatized by what had happened. Um, at, le at least she never publicly spoke mm. of it again. Mm. So what really happened? Well, my friends, let me introduce you to something, a little something, I call the Yeti. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Hell yeah! <laughs> I wish, I wish. Unfortunately, uh, this isn't the Yeti story. But we do have some other theories mm. of what really happened at Kamar Daban. Uh, as some of you have been have heard, and as I mentioned at the top, I'm sure a lot of people are listening to this and saying, Dyatlov Pass, Mike and Keith. And yes, there's a lot of similarities between uh, the Kamar Daban incident and Dyatlov Pass incident of February 1959. So, just run through really quickly, the Atlas Pass incident took place on Mount Kilatsikl. Uh, appropriately, the Mansi to English translation is the Mountain of the Dead. Nice. Uh, as I said, in February 1959, the TLDR is that nine Soviet hikers, ten originally, but one turned back early due to illness, died under bizarre circumstances, and over the years there's been a shitload of theories from aliens to monsters to psychic weapons, mass hallucination... A lot of things which could probably be copy and paste mm. to this case. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what's mad though? With, what's that, Keith? I'll tell you, Mike. So with that case, with the the Atlov Pass, yeah. when you hear all these theories, it's always like, God, I wish that someone had survived so they could just tell us. Mm -hmm. In this story, in the Kalmar Daban, someone did survive and we still don't know. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't think it makes a difference. Like. Usually when somebody, if somebody were to survive, you'd be like, oh, it's actually something really basic and simple mm. happened and you're yeah. just getting all your theories pulling out your ass yeah. and this is the person who survived and it's like it actually sounds even worse I, know. Like, <laughs> I don't think even if, if she had died too and the bodies had been found that way yeah. they it would have been a hypothermia so, so yeah. something went wrong exactly you wouldn't have imagined them bashing their own heads off the rocks yeah 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 it's really really weird so recent developments in the yet of past mystery um came from a formal investigation finally done by the Russian government, leading them to conclude that it was pretty much, it was a boring old avalanche that was most likely responsible for the Dyatlov Pass mystery. Um, that's always been a common theory, but the most boring one, so hence it gets the least attention. But hey, listen, why talk about an avalanche when you can talk about aliens mm. or sonic weapons? It's far more interesting. So, unfortunately though, an avalanche doesn't exactly help offer an explanation for Kamar Daban, as uh, there simply probably wasn't an avalanche. There was a little bit of snow uh, then, hmm. but not like avalanche. <laughs> Just snow. like a dusting. No! Yeah, I oh, know. <laughs> Plus, as you said, we have uh, Valia, who probably would have noticed an avalanche. Yeah. So, there you go. I think we can cut out that Scratch one. Scratch it off. Yeah. So, next, what about it was altitude sickness mm. that drove the members of the party, the Camerad party, insane? Mm. So, altitude sickness, could it have been that, Keith? 
do you think? So I can definitely understand why folks were into this idea. Mm-hmm. Like the acute mountain sickness, it kicks in when you're when you're up high and dealing with less air pressure and oxygen. And the quicker you shoot up these mountain ranges, the higher the chance you'll catch it. And as we know, Ludmilla was kind of in a hurry to catch up with her daughter. Mm-hmm. So they were so they, they were rushing, acclimatized, or whatever. Yeah, they didn't acclimatize because I think it takes about like two weeks to acclimatize. No, I, I don't think it's that big of a mountain, but yeah. they were still rushing up yeah. the side of the mountain quite quickly. And the symptoms of altitude sickness. They, they kind of match up with what the gang experienced, um, like being all confused and coughing up blood. Plus, freezing temps up there, combined with less oxygen in your blood, make you more prone to hypothermia, which is what was ruled as the cause of death. But there are some holes in the theory as well. For example, there were two other groups up on the mountain at the same time, and none of them showed any signs of altitude sickness. Mm-hmm. Also, even though in severe cases, altitude sickness can lead to fluid in the lungs, swelling in the brain and death. For everyone to experience that, it's like a one in a million shot. Yeah. Okay. All right. You you g- grabbed me and you, you never let me go. That's I'm a gonna, good explanation. I'm going I'm to I'm scratch it off. Yeah. An- another one ticked off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're back on aliens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, or... Uh, yeti aliens. <laughs> How about... Yeah, yeti aliens. <laughs> How about nerve gas agent okay, okay. was exposed? Which this is actually a leading theory, and I mm-hmm. think it actually makes the most sense. I'm hooked. Reel me in, man. Yeah. So the first and most widely considered uh, as a serious option is the idea of a military or government experiment gone either very wrong or concerningly right, mm. depending on what you think the aim was. The idea of the group being exposed to some kind of nerve agent is... It's definitely one for the more conspiratorial-minded uh, among us, but uh, one that has, well, a notable coincidence, shall we say. A particular Russian nerve agent called Novichok being used. Uh, most famously, it was used in the recent past, in the 2018 Salisbury poisonings. Um, father and daughter, Sergei and Yulia Skripal in Salisbury, England, uh, March 2018. They were poisoned by Russian secret agents. Um, This incident was then followed by a secondary incident in which a British couple were also poisoned by the same nerve agent, Novichok, thought to be caused by discarded contaminated materials used in the targeted attacks on the Skripples four months earlier. So that's how dangerous it is. Four months later, and it was on contaminated... Still highly potent, yeah. Still, yeah, was still able to, to hospitalize people. A police officer was also hospitalized when responding to the original uh, incident. Basically, the whole thing was an international shit show. It was across newspapers for for many months. Um, So, yeah, the thing, though, about this particular nerve agent is the effects it has are very similar to what the Cameron Tappan experienced. Also, the Novichok nerve agent, this particular Russian nerve agent, is known to have been developed by Soviet scientists between the years 1971 and... Dun-dun-dun... 1993. Of course, the year 1993 is when the Kamar Daban incident took place. And what better way to test out your fancy new experimental nerve agent than on some hikers in the middle of nowhere, right? Mm. Mm. No one will ever talk about it again. No, Especially exactly. Not in the yeah. podcast in Ireland. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ragged scene. No! It's like shaking their fists at the sky. <laughs> So, essentially, this theory simply says that the Kammer Dabin group were unwitting participants in a human trial of Novichok. Maybe, perhaps, Valia was the control subject. Some have even suggested that her reluctance to speak to the press may be out of fear that this is the case, though it's more likely her unspeakable trauma is more likely to blame. Mm. I, I subscribe to the Novichok I like that. theory uh, yeah. uh, a lot. If it wasn't man-made, maybe it was like some natural one in the air mm. or uh, released from the ground. Mm. You know, like with, like global warming, all this like shit is coming up mm. from the ground, like anthrax and yeah, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Maybe it was like something to do with that. I think this theory is my favorite. I have another theory, which I'll talk about after. Okay. But I think my theory is my second favorite theory. And right. it is kind of natural. And we'll get to it. We'll, we'll, right. we'll, we'll get to it. Folks, you heard it here first. Fucking hold on to your butts. <laughs> Keith's got another theory. <laughs> All right. Well, here's another one. Infrasound. Infrasound, my friends. Uh, it's an interesting explanation which was actually suggested by a member of the rescue team that was sent to retrieve the bodies. So, infrasound is both a natural and man-made phenomena, and it basically it, it's basically sounds that fall into the extreme lower end of human hearing, usually described as being between 20 and 1.5 hertz. It can be audible, but to what extent depends on the person. All sorts of effects of infrasound on human beings have been reported, including vertigo, 
difficulty in balancing, even while standing still, uh, and other various types of disorientation. Some people have experienced bowel spasms. Uh, the, the brown note. The brown note, that's <laughs> yeah. what I was thinking too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, nausea, even unusual resonances in internal organs, uh, including heart palpitations, have been documented from the sounds, or it's really the vibrations of the sounds that are causing this in a human body. That's actually uh, one thing I patented that chapter tangent time um <laughs> i back in the early days of youtube when i was just starting out like in 2017 i made a video on why we see ghosts and that's a common ex or one theory of why people see ghosts is it's actually there's a certain hertz mm. that when the human body hears it it causes dread and hallucinations because ah. of that vibrations yeah yeah uh and that's an explanation for, and it, that's why people see ghosts a lot of times in older buildings mm. something to do with the structures uh maybe wind going through a building causes yeah. a certain vibration the way it resonates through it or something yeah, yeah exactly and yeah. Uh, this hurts affects the human body and that's yeah. why you can hallucinate you can see things out of the corner of your eye yeah. you feel dread you feel scared you start hallucinating ghosts and mm. i've heard that was one uh one theory on what ghosts actually are because you get the feeling yeah. of like oh, there's somebody in the room with me it's yeah like, yeah no yeah. you're just it's just a noise <laughs> yeah it's just a noise yeah. and then you'll see like a yeah. shadow or something or it's a noise emanating from the ghost Ooh. which is making you dread <laughs> they're making that noise yeah exactly <laughs> it's going bow, <laughs> standing near the corner <laughs> yeah sound like a didgeridoo bow, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> and tell me you make your noise bow. <laughs> that'd be awesome <laughs> yeah man keep going yeah <laughs> So, infrasound could explain the group's symptoms as well as explaining why Valia didn't seem to be affected in the same way as the others, or perhaps she was just in a different way, because that's always the weirdest thing is why Valia didn't experience either the sudden death or the um, psychosis of going insane and mm. then the sudden death. Oh, did you imagine that she was deaf? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> that would, I would have thrown my uh, a can of coke in your face if that was the case. The really interesting part of the infrasound explanation is yet another mystery. What generated the sound that essentially killed six otherwise healthy people? As I mentioned, there's a whole bunch of natural and man-made ways infrasound can be generated. Let's talk about the man-made ways first, because that's way more interesting. A nefarious option takes us back into the good old Russian government conspiracy territory. Now, this is a... Uh, let's talk about, for something about how you can create infrasound. Uses a weapon is what I mean. Right. A fair amount of online sleuths have suggested a diagnosis of Havana Syndrome. Havana Syndrome, super interesting, by the way. It's, mm -hmm. I think it's worthy of an episode in itself. Because mm -hmm. it's something I've always wanted to do a deep dive on. Um, is a term used to explain a long list of symptoms varying in severity from an annoying ringing in your ears all the way to unbearable pain and even confusion and difficulty in balancing. The name Havana Syndrome itself comes from the first reported cases back in 2016 that just so happened to be reported in the US uh, and Canadian embassy in Havana, Cuba, with several staff members complaining of a whole heap of symptoms. In 2017, the strange illness appeared to have become a pandemic when dozens more people, mostly, almost only, US intelligence officials and military personnel, they too began to have similar experiences in China, India, a couple of European countries, even in Washington DC itself. Very strange. It was like it was only targeting secret agents mm. or people who may be secret agents or spies or whatever around the globe and only seemingly American ones too. So that's why they began to think it was a targeted weapon being used against them. Federal investigators from the US as well as the Departments uh, of State and Defense all banded together, calling the incidents anomalous health incidents, which sounds very cool and bizarre mm. and kind of creepy, mm. and said most were likely unrelated cases or even psychosomatic, with the afflicted having heard about Havana Syndrome, and then they say, oh, Jesus, well, you know, I have a two. Can I have the day off? <laughs> right, I had a few too many beers last night. I think I have Havana Syndrome. That's like, Havana Syndrome, it kind of sounds like, you know, that you have too too much rum. Exactly, and, uh, yeah. And cigars. <laughs> That's exactly, yeah. Came down with a bad case of yeah. Havana Syndrome. Oh, I come down with Havana Syndrome again. <laughs> So, where do the Russians come in in Havana Syndrome? Well, despite the official line being that the incidents were AHIs, anomalous health incidents that are, were lumped together, several members of the US intelligence community reported their own suspiciones that some kind of sonic weapon had been used to induce the symptoms 
and the most likely culprit was the usual culprit. The Ruskies. Mm, mm, always. Even when it's not the Ruskies, it's the Ruskies. <laughs> but uh, then again, having said that, it's like given their track record um, lately, probably not them. They're, it seems like they're not very adept at really anything at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, so who knows? Maybe the sonic weapon was, again, mm. they were, you know, experimented on by uh, by the Russian government. Um, the power of suggestion is a powerful thing, of course. And the madness of the Kamerdaban group being, you know, all in their heads. Um, I don't think that's real. I mean, it's a possibility is what people are suggesting, that it was mm. either a sonic weapon or it was just a mass psychogenic illness. And they all went insane because they believed they were going insane. Mm. Um, who knows? Be cool if they made the sonic weapon to shoot out those hurts you were talking about to make you see ghosts. Oh, or make you poop your pants. Oh, that'd be better. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. Ghosts and shit your pants. What a combination. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Fucking hell. Oh. Well, I think it, well, probably doing, having seen one would probably do the other anyway. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's very yeah. true. Well, and sometimes when I die reason about it, I thought I saw ghosts, so you never know. <laughs> Uh, and of course, though, you can get infrasound from natural causes too. Um, earthquakes, violent volcanic eruptions, severe storms, even passing meteors can generate infrasound. However, there's one specific natural cause that stands head and shoulders above the rest on the probability scale. It just so happens that a major cause of infrasound is airflow over mountains. And they were on the mountain. <gasps> <gasps> oh my god! <laughs> Airflow over mountainous terrain has been observed and documented um, generating infrasound or sound within the infrasonic range. And given that air group were walking on a mountain range when things went south and each suffered mysterious unexplained symptoms, well, that could be a possible cause. However, I don't think it's that because mm. I feel like this would be a well more documented thing mm. if that was what caused it people yeah. go hiking and mountain climbing all the fucking time yeah, yeah and yeah. they've never bashed their own heads in against the wall and been foaming from the mouth yeah it feels like it'd be more just of annoying noise yeah, rather than yeah. making you go mentally insane yeah it kind of reminds me of the um do you ever hear that uh what's called teom or tomb home it happened in like new mexico it's like this unexplained low pitch home some mm. some people can hear it and some people can't mm -hmm. uh, the people who can hear it say that they can hear it all the time while others say that they hear it some of the times but they can tune it out where other ones are like I can hear it all the time it's driving me fucking nuts yeah so uh, it kind of reminds me of that but they think it could come from like um, the electrical grid or hearing problems or mm. but it could be this as well the I said like airflow yeah very very, very possible yeah mm. there you go uh, Keith you said yes. you had a final theory for us today so I have two. Oh, so you. one I don't really like. But Look at you. I'll say it anyway. Yeah, do, uh, the, do the shit one first. I'll do we it. Yeah. All right, we'll scoff at your theory. All right, so the first one is contaminated water. Uh -huh. So uh, Lake Baikal is, it's a well-known toxic waste dumping ground. Well, it's very deep, as you said. It's like it is five very miles deep. deep or something. It is very deep. And it's extremely, uh, there's like so much toxic waste in it. Uh, especially like in recent years, just people are just like dumping. Well, hey, this is pretty deep. You can fit a lot of toxic waste in there. There you go. Who cares? Fuck <laughs> <laughs> <Bug> them. <laughs> so. Fuck <laughs> 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 <Hope> you, Lake. <laughs> Stupid fish. <laughs> so if the waste was washed downstream and into the water, the hikers could have accidentally drank the deadly toxins with their breakfast. They the contaminant it could have been one of those nerve agents that you mentioned as well that mm. was put into the water uh valentina may have survived by drinking less or not even drinking that water maybe she had her own supply but the most highly toxic substances take a few minutes to take effects hence why all the hikers were kind of dying at different times so maybe mm. they, were, they all fill up their jugs and they were drinking at different times and they all started dropping at different times and um, the problem with this theory is that the deaths were an isolated occurrence if it was the water source used by many tourists and it was so badly contaminated it doesn't really make sense that only one group was affected by it uh run with me here for a second okay right so maybe there was like toxic water in the lake mm -hmm. and it got <sighs> sucked up into the clouds Okay. Because that's how we make clouds, I believe. Okay. Something like that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, don't quote me on this. Yeah. But then, remember, it was raining a lot the two days before oh. this shit happened. Yeah, yeah. And Ludomilla had them camping out in the middle of the open rather than getting shelter. Mm. So the water got extra drenched. So maybe the toxic water goes into the yeah. sky. Okay. It goes, moves along. The clouds yeah. have a little smiley face on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it goes, it pees on them. <laughs> that's the clouds peeing on people. <laughs> they get it. Yeah. And that set a to And plus they were, you know, they were going nonstop. Stop. They hadn't. Mm. They hadn't been resting properly. Yeah. So maybe they were really tired. They mm. were soaked wet mm -hmm. and toxic shit mm. made them go insane. 
Kobe. And then Valia, she went into the forest. Ah, remember? Yeah, she, yeah. While the other stayed on the on the ridge. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. Yeah. But hey, I like this, where I'm going. This could be the signal talking. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, I've got it. Nobody has got me. <laughs> so hot. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I've got nerve agents. <laughs> <laughs> No, I like that. Yeah, I, I do know. go take like a really highly specific set of circumstances for that yeah. to work. I, yeah, possibly. I mean, stranger things have happened. Yeah, because when you like, there's many theories. It's always made of a point that it rained a lot. They got the weather forecast wrong, mm. and that also they had been going like nonstop. Mm. Very few of the theories kind of tie into that. Mm. Uh, so I'm like, hmm. Well, maybe the fact that they were tired added into the psychosis or whatever they experienced. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, they got some kind of illness or bug or something yeah. that affected they were tired, they were wet. Maybe mm. their immune system was like down because they were tired and soaking. I don't know. Mm. Hey, listen, this is just off the, this is, this is, this is Top original. This is OG Mike, you know, here. <laughs> original, I'm just off the dome here. Yeah. Listen. The tinfoil hat is on. I just say words, I have no idea where the sentence is going. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's a surprise for all of us. Exactly. Surprise for me too. <laughs> so, uh, what's the other theory? Okay, I like this one. Okay. okay. So, Ludmilla, she was renowned for her skills in forage and she would have taught this knowledge to her students. Because of this, there is a possibility that during their hike, one of the hikers came across mushrooms and added them into their breakfast, un unaware that they were of the magic variety. That makes the absolute most sense. That's mm. the most likely theory. Yeah, they add like poisonous mushrooms right? or something. Right, yeah. Uh, as a result, after eating breakfast, the effects of the mushroom poisoning kicked in while they were walking. Yeah. So psilocybin is the hallucinogenic chemical in certain mushrooms known as magic mushrooms yeah eating mushrooms that contain psilocybin i think uh, can have a variety of effects like hallucinations sickness anxiety and panic now i believe these magic mushrooms they have pretty low level of toxicity making death through overdose extremely unlikely mm -hmm. however it could explain why members of the group made such bizarre judgment calls which ultimately led to their death from exposure and hypothermia also, it could explain the bleeding from the eyes and the ears. Perhaps that was just all hallucinations, which mm. is something that people on Magic Mushrooms have experienced before. Uh, mm. When they were like, have a really bad trip, it's like, oh, I've seen people bleeding from their eyes. Right. Shit. So I, I, I think that's a strong theory. That's a good one. Mm. I like that one as well. Yeah, Valia, she only spoken about once. She was mm. extremely traumatized, tired, maybe a little bit drunk when she was giving it. Mm. They'd given her vodka. Um... Yeah. Yeah, because if like, it's I guess... a likely theory. If you unknowingly took an hallucinogenic and you didn't know it's hallucinogenic, yeah. things would get fucking fucked oh, up Oh, you'd be real scared. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You wouldn't know what the fuck is going on. You'd be yeah, terrified. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. That's good. There mm. you go. That's it. That's our theories on the Camara de mm. um, An unsolved mystery to this day. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> day. <laughs> every, every time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know why I burp so much on this podcast. <laughs> It's, I think it's classic Mike at this point. Yeah. <laughs> it's expected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, there you go. Mm. Interesting story. Yeah, I liked it. Yeah. yeah Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. You <laughs> Thank you. All right. Here, listen. Well, here, you know what, folks? You can let us know your thoughts on uh, on this mysterious case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, wherever you want to, really. Uh, so you can DM Keith on his Instagram now that you've cracked the case. Is your Instagram <laughs> private or public? Uh, it's... It's still public. There's, like, there's nothing on it. It's a picture of me. You probably like, even not know you, you rarely even log in. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's nothing very, like, there's nothing on it that would, I'm worried about that people will see, so. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you so much for listening. Um, Keith, any yeah. final thoughts? Uh, I don't know. If you see some mushrooms on the ground, don't pick them up and eat them. Or do. I'm not your mother. I don't yeah, care. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Do, you know what? Yeah. You do you. Yeah. You do you. That's what I always say. Listen, who am I to judge? Uh, all right. Thank you so much for listening. It means a lot to me and Keith. Uh, as always, new episode of the That Shopper Podcast out every Monday manana. Um, so give it a go. And um, yeah, listen. Kind of wraps up this old one. I'm going to go get some medication yeah. uh, right now. So we we'll look forward to that. <laughs> but uh, hey, listen, guys. Until the next one, take care of each other and yourselves. Because we love you. And I'll see ya. All right. Thanks, guys. How do you pronounce Kamar Daban? Kamar Daban incident. Kamar Daban. Kamar Daban. Ah, oh, okay. fuck. I'm saying Kamar Daban. <laughs> this is how I say the damn thing. <laughs> Kamar right? Daban. Kamar Daban. <laughs> this ain't kind of fun to say, though. Kamar Daban. 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 All right. Come on for a few points. Kamar Daban. Kamar Daban. <laughs>